And we're back. Welcome to the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. Uh, not sure if this is going to be 17 or 18. I think it's somewhere in the double digits. Yeah, I think it's 17. Oh, yeah, because we started out. All right, I know where I'm at now. So where you are is listening to the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. I am your humble host, John Dayton. To my immediate left around the old campfire is Anthony Kuzabucky. Hey there, people. You can hear the uh, numerous tree frogs, crickets, and cicadas chirping away, the chorus of the night, campfire crackling nearby. And hopefully not too many drunk people from the bar down the street. We haven't had quite as much of a karaoke problem lately. It's, um, it's, it's a nice change. All right, so the reason uh, I was having a hard time remembering which show this was is, one, uh, I've been on a lot of gigs this week, and on one in particular since about 8 this morning, and I went camping with my family last night, and... Well, a camping trip's not a camping trip <laughs> unless your tent gets blown over by a thunderstorm at 5 a.m. and you wind up trying to tie a clove hitch in the dark, <laughs> in the rain, in your skivvies. So that's what I was doing. At least you had pants on. Yeah. Well, shorts, anyway. Yeah. So, Something. So that happened. And then today uh, we had a gig at work. There was a, an outside group doing a like a youth rally or something. Typical thing. A couple of speakers and a band. Band turned out to be really cool. Bella Reeve, if you're ever listening or if you know Bella Reeve, say hi to him for me. Cool bunch of guys and lady. Had a super chill load in. It was like meeting my long lost cousins. Like not not that we're super tight, but I just you know it is when you meet a group of people that like you get them, yep. they get you. Everybody's cool. You just want to hang out, do your thing, make some music. Had a great day with them, uh, but a long one, so I'm sleepy. Yep. And also, I had already started this podcast once with Nate, actually about two weeks ago, I think. <laughs> Uh, Nate's a young protege of ours. Uh, he does a bunch of work with Gordon. Uh, I met him years ago. He was one of the, the kids. Uh, met him along with Chachi at a, a local high school. They were taking care of all the high school theater productions and kind of wanted to hook up with us and do some gigs with us. So Nate's done a little bit of rock with me, quite a bit of rock with Gordon. He's done some theater, and he is now studying. Uh, he's studying to be a professionally technical director right. at a local university. So anyway, we had him at the barbecue last week. Uh, we popped open the laptop. He asked us a couple questions, and I'll probably get crafty and splice those in so you can actually hear him <laughs> talk a little bit. Um, but we decided to make this a Q&A show. We also heard from uh, another one of our German listeners. So uh, Guten Tag to, Guten Tag to, shoot, we just Mike. looked up his name, Michael. In Germany. Uh, Hi, Mike. Found us, listened to all our podcasts. So you know he is... Uh, he claims not to be a professional. He's just an, an avid amateur, and but he is a man after our own hearts because that's what we do. I, I discover <laughs> a podcast. I need to listen to all the episodes, and yep. I, I pursue it. So he got caught up fast. He's up to the present, and uh, fortunately, we are up to the present, too. We don't have any shows recorded in advance, so uh, this is it. Michael sent us a, just an awesome uh, thank you letter for the writing and the, the talking that we do, so that made it all very much worthwhile. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Don't, don't hesitate to, to send your warm words, though. The, we, we would do this anyway because it's a release for us and a, a chance for us to put our heads together. But it is nice to know that some people are out there listening, even if it's not our own countrymen, because sound guys are sound guys the world over. Yep. The only thing different is when you is, is how you check the mic, really. That, you know, like I, I was thinking while we watched the Olympics and stuff, the, the one thing that I, I kind of hesitated to say on the last podcast but kind of want to get out now is, um, and I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if it offends any servicemen at all. But soundmen are kind of like Marines, first in, last out, and we take care of all the dirty business in between. That's, we never leave our own behind. <laughs> exactly. It's it, it's something that you know, regardless of your experience or or your professional ability, we stick together as much as we can, and, and we often deal with the same type of problems as everybody else. It's not obviously as intense as what a marine faces at all, but um, on our on our front, it's it's what we do. Sweet. So yeah, we also uh, we're we're still working on getting around to it, but uh, I'm not going to rem- be able to remember this. Other- I'm terrible with names, <laughs> folks. I can Ica Ica. <laughs> if I meet you on a stage as a musician, years will go by. I will remember the night. I will remember your instrument, where you stood, what was in your monitor mix, and not your name. Not your name. <laughs> Sorry, dude. That's just how I am. I remember everything there is to know about your input and nothing about you yourself. So don't it's, take it personal. It's true. John didn't know my name for about three years. <laughs> and he was the best man of my wedding. It's it's okay. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> but um, we're hoping to get together with Ica at some point and just chat a little about Because I'm, I'm pretty sure the only difference between us and sound guys from Europe is that we go... 
one, two, hey, hey, two, two. And they go, chick, one, two, hey, two, two, two. There's just that slight, there's like an umlaut over it. <laughs> And there's there's a lot more voltage coming in than what we got. I'm actually Double thinking about shit. running all my amps are are multi phase or multi voltage. So I'm I'm actually thinking about driving my my speakers that I still have. Uh, as long as I'm not around, hooking up the distro and, and running them at 220. See if I can get a little extra oomph. Well, it's, I wonder if it's the same as as running a pedal from. Nine volts as opposed to eighteen volts, and just doubling the voltage. It's exa- well, it's not exactly like that, but it well, should no, be it should be cleaner and clearer. It, I'm open thinking it up a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, one other thing I wanted to mention was uh, I had a cool revelation this week. And to those of you who are beat builders and producers and who mess around with things like Logic and Ableton and Fruity Loops and all that stuff, um, I had an experience. I wrote, <laughs> I wrote about this on the blog. I think it went up Wednesday this week. Um, so look it up. And I forget what I titled it. I'd have to look it up. But um, I had this instance where I, I needed a repeating bell for a musical, built yep. the cue. And it's really hard to find more than a dozen bell hits uh, in, in, so- in sound effects libraries, unless you make it yourself, and I didn't have access to a large bell where I was at the time. Should have done that when we were in Philadelphia. Ooh, <laughs> put him in. Would have real nice, and I'm sure we would have had a quite a quite a bit of government interference. I just watched my laptop put the screen to sleep. I hope there's enough juice in this MacBook to run an interface feeding fandom power to a couple of mics all night. We'll see. Ah, probably plenty. It's cool. all right. Um, but anyway, I had this bell, and I, I won't bore you with the details, but uh, it was a revelation to me to find out, uh, to figure out, and it actually it literally came to me in my sleep. I, I eat, sleep, and dream sound, and uh, while I was drowsing in my in the royal slumber one morning, came up with the idea, like, oh, I just need to slide the, the two samples back over each other, do a crossfade, boom de ba I, I wound up with, like, 22 hits. So I was like, there you go. Cut it off when you're done with it. Yep. And uh, I've, I've done that a lot with... Especially if you can if you can deal with with drummers that are dead on to a click or somebody, whatever your scratch track is on. A, I'm sorry, on a recording interface or or basis, if you can deal with somebody that's close enough to the click, you can do that too. I've I've copy and pasted enough drum sessions, bass sessions, guitar sessions to to know that even if it's not 100 percent perfect, it's a little bit easier sometimes to just nudge certain notes here and there than and trying to get a, a full, complete, nice take out of somebody that's not up to the task. And if you're doing overdubs, I mean, this isn't the tape days. Start a new track, punch them in, have them overlap. Punch them in a little bit early so you can do a nice crossfade, and if there are any inconsistencies in the playing or the equipment, the volume or anything like that, you can get a nice transition into a punch for a guitar track or keys or whatever. It's, it's important for acoustic instruments like piano, yep. stuff that has a natural resonance that's, that's that hard to duplicate. That, that's what I've done actually a lot this week is it, from... From a f- from a few months ago, what I've tried to do is is do guitar takes front to back on a whole track, and um, it turned out to be a lot easier to do section by section, do an intro of a song, have them play into the first verse, and then go back and have them redo the first verse, and then pre-chorus, chorus, all that type of stuff, and it it ends up sounding a lot better and cleaner, and uh, your your musicians aren't a lot or aren't as much played out, I guess, by the end of a four or five six minute long song. Yep. All right, and just so we don't burn up the whole show taking care of housekeeping, I just want to do a couple other quick shout-outs. Uh, I'd like to shout-out to my boss, Brian, who listens to every episode and attempts to read every post. And hey, Brian. And that's much appreciated because dude sits 10 feet from me. And uh, anyway, I <laughs> wanted to thank him for that because he's, he's not likely to send me an email or anything. He touches me on Twitter. <laughs> i throw you something across the room. I'd, I'd like to say thank you to Darren, too, um, who's, been, who's been like a second dad really, and, and let me borrow guitars and instruments and all that kind of good stuff, too. And also Amanda's mom, who is a frequent listener. She doesn't get any of it, <laughs> but she's in there listening. She still and, listens. And Thanks. We, we Thanks, appreciate mom. that. No end. Thank you, Mom. You have no idea. Um, yeah, that's Anthony's mother-in-law. Yep. And she is not one of those mother-in-laws that you roll your eyes like, ugh, the mother-in-law. She's We delightful. actually like her. Yeah, she's delightful. She's a nice lady. All right, so moving on, and uh, this will be the point where I splice in Nate's first question. Um, probably, actually, let me wake this thing up and make a mark here. Eh, there we go. Um, <laughs> Nate, what? Well, I'd like to know more about ribbon mics in general. Like, what is their purpose? How do they work? And kind of the basics of them. Because I've read about them before, but I've never actually seen one or played with one. Where's Brian? Brian Moore's around here somewhere, right? Master of the ribbon mic. Mm. We should have Skyped him in. Him or her. Um, oh, jeez. Guy from Nashville. Kevin Brusher. Yes. With his... his Wonderful phantom ridden mic techniques. The reason we say that is because those guys, uh, we'll jump right to the uses. Uh, Kevin, where he started, and Brian eventually bought the studio from him, 
Uh, and it might not have even been either one of those guys that discovered it. It might have been the previous owners. Uh, but at any rate, there was a studio. They made a magic. Weird L-shaped room, and it had a real specific drum sound. Anything that came out of there, you could hear. It you know, it was Viking. Right. It was originally the word-of-mouth drum sound, then it became right. the Viking drum sound, and then it kind of became temporarily the Red Booth sound until he moved. But, you know, if you and we've talked about this on the podcast before. If you put the drum kit just here and angled it just so and close mic'd it, and then you put a room mic, which was generally a ribbon mic. I don't think it was a Next. Royer. I don't know if it was a Royer, but it was it was next to that recliner, whatever that yep, recliner. Yeah, you put uh, there was a spot <laughs> marked on the carpet. You parked the ribbon mic right there at a certain height, certain orientation, and in a certain relationship to the recliner. Yep. And you just got this magic, magic room sound. Like you just it, it, spike tape is your friends. Yep. It, yeah, when you find that magic friends. spot, spike it off. Mark yep. it, mark it for later use. Um, so ribbon mics, what they are, they're a little bit different than other types of mics. Uh, a dynamic microphone, you got a, a diaphragm in there. It's attached to a little coil of wire that moves back and forth in relationship to a magnetic field, and that's how you get the electricity for the signal. A condenser mic does the same thing, except you have two plates. Uh, one of them is charged, and your voice moves the other one. And the the difference, you know, it's basically a capacitor. It, that's why they're called it's, condenser mics. Condenser is the old word for capacitor. Yep. And uh, your voice changes the gap in that capacitor, and you're able to get an audio signal out of that. Now, condenser mics, some of them are an electric condenser mic is sort of permanently charged. They use materials that that maintain a static electric, electrical charge. Um, but yep. most condenser mics take phantom power right, or a battery or something. something. Phantom power, we're not going to get into that. Your, your board can supply the power that it needs, basically, right. to do there's, its job. There's that plus 48 button or whatever it is in, in Europe that you need to press down. Otherwise, it does nothing. Right. And But you can get away with as little as one and a half volts. I know plenty of condenser mics that work fine yep. on a, a AAA battery. Um, and there's, there's a certain kinds that you actually have to have a separate. There's a, uh, a Rode NTK mic. They needed a phantom power, but it didn't take phantom power from every, anything else other than the phantom power uh, box that it came with. It was a it was like a, a five pin. rail system or something. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was a, it was a five pin box, um, and obviously, if, if it's one of those things where a microphone they were setting up on stage comes with an external power supply, you should probably use that because that'll at least um, attenuate the power correctly to what needs to get the microphone needs to get back out of it. And generally with with, uh, condenser mics, they'll work on almost any voltage, but they work best at the manufacturer's rated voltage, which anymore is generally 48. Uh, But with vintage mics, you got to check and see. Uh, What you'll find is, like, if you go out to do some field recording with a condenser microphone, you know, unless your interface has, like, a cap ladder or something in there, some method to bump the voltage up, you won't get all the dynamic range possible out of the mic. Uh, You may get some increased noise floor at lower voltages. So they're really... Hey, you might want to mess with that, too, in the studio. You know, if you have variable phantom power, you might get different performance out of a mic. But anyway, without yep. spending too much time on it, a ribbon mic is just a special kind of condenser mic. Uh, one of the oldest types of mic there are, um, you know, there's the crystal mic, which is like the old old radio mics that you'd see with the spider. The old RCA. Yep, you know, th- that old RCA mic that you're picturing in your head right now is a... Uh, is exactly what we're talking Quite about. probably a crystal mic, but also possibly a ribbon mic. And what the excuse me, ribbon mic does is... Uh, the element is a very, and I mean very, like a few molecules of metal thick piece of foil uh, that makes up part of the capacitor. And, you know, it, it has its charge on it. Your voice moves it a little bit, and they are incredibly sensitive. Um, but they're also a little dark sounding. And they're, uh, you can look this up. There's a bunch of good articles about it on the Internet. Um, I just read one not too long ago on Pro Sound Web, so go there and seek that out. Um, the the older ones are not great to put in front of guitar cabinets, bass no. cabinets. Like that's that's and especially if you're dealing with one for the first time, make sure that you do not give it phantom power. A lot of the old mics, especially, um, you throw 48 volts on it and it, it you're done. Yep. That mm-hmm. mic is cooked. Whatever whatever the manufacturer specs, um, and also the elements on them. I mean, we're talking about like gold leaf. For the ribbon, uh-huh. um, or you know, some other metal. I don't know what's what's typical. Um, so traditionally, they were not used for a guitar. What they were used for was back in the days of one track recording. You'd have your orchestra about as far away from the mic as you could get them in the studio, and then Louis Armstrong half that distance away, singing and playing the horn. Yep. And and that was it. Like you mixed by moving Louis Armstrong closer to or farther from the mic. Um, and that, that that goes a lot back to last podcast with the dynamic playing and the musicality of it, where yeah. 
if you don't have a, a instrumentalist or a vocalist that can control their their dynamic range, ribbon mic is is not the way to go. <laughs> I'm going to call somebody out on this. Um, the reason they did this was uh, they're incredibly sensitive. You can you can pick up a lot of nuance. You you hear old recordings that were done on you know tape machines and even wire recorders in the 30s, and you're like, how on earth did they get it to sound so good? Mm -hmm. Well, what it is is the mics were very high impedance, which means they uh, don't didn't output a lot of level, but they were incredibly sensitive. Um, and I'm going to call somebody out on this, Jim McElwain, if he's listening. He told <laughs> us in a, a class that I took in college, and he would do this. He would about at least a quarter of what he taught us was complete and utter bullshit, and he would just throw it all out there in the same tone of voice and leave it up to us. So I could tell you a bunch of stories about stuff that we figured out at the time, but I, I may still be carrying around a, a packet or two of incorrect information. Anyway, kids, Possible. what he told us was the reason that faders on a console are called faders, except if you work in radio, and then they're called pots, which is what they actually are, a potentiometer. Yep. Um, but uh, they were called faders because the original device was a cart with rubber wheels and a push handle, and whoever that soloist was, Louis Armstrong, say... You know, if he's playing trumpet, he needed to be 30 feet from the mic, and if he was going to sing, he needed to be 10 feet from the mic. And it was the studio assistant's job to push him from one location to the other, or he would, you know, tiptoe back and forth in his socks. Um, but that cart was called a <laughs> fader. You could fade him away in the mix by sliding yep. him back and forth. And Phys I don't know if physically, yeah, you know, so that, that may be BS or not. Um, but one thing that is true is some early recording consoles were designed with the faders, what we would now call upside down. You pulled the fader closer to you at the operating position to make something louder, pull it closer to you in the mix, and pushed it away. So, like, a fader all the way up was off, and the closer you brought it to you, the louder the input It's, it's like that. What, if anybody's dealt with a new, I think it's OXX, or OSX Lion, the, on your mouse, the, yeah. the, the scrolling is reversed. And so you, annoying. You can switch it. Forth. Right. Like, I've, I've gotten used to it, so it's okay now, but... If you don't know what you're doing, you're scrolling and you're like, what What the hell? <laughs> why, why am I going up when it's supposed to be going down? I have no idea. But I'm getting so I do it automatically. But, yes, right. it's, it's that pretense. Um, so I'm going to do just a half, a half a minute more on the tech of ribbon mics, and then I'm going to let Anthony talk about uses while I throw more wood on the fire. Um, years ago, they were not good to put close on guitar amps. As they have become more popular in recording, um, They've been companies have been either going guys will go in and mod old ones or all completely new designs have come out that are much more robust to God. the point where you can even use them live in a concert setting. God bless Royer. Yeah. Um, and the cool thing about them is they they have they tend to have a dark response and you'll need to go look up one of these articles. I should have looked it up. Sorry, Nate. You'll have to go to Pro Sound Web and look up the Ribbon Mic article. It might even been a Bobby O. Uh, Bobby Ozinski article, but yeah. Um, there's that something about them right. like the. The frequency response of one part of them and the frequency response of another part of them basically form a V and where they cross over. I don't know. It, it basically it, it it really makes like if you're in a recording setting and you've got the nicer ribbon mics where you can like the the nicer I think it's a 121 is the mono model and it's it's decent size so it's it's but they roll off the highs a little was where I was trying do. to get with that right yeah so y you can't just use the ribbon mic. Um, you, you can, but you can't. So when it comes down to it, it's it's really, really nice to, to use a 57 or a 609 even just to compensate for that high-end loss you're getting or even a, a large diaphragm condenser just to, to catch the peaks and to catch that high-end that you're not getting with the, the ribbon mic. Because either way, with the ribbon mic or without the ribbon mic, um, as good as it sounds, when you really push that into the mix, it's not... It, it's not that it's not getting anywhere. It's that it's not cutting through as hard as you would like it to. So um, what I found a lot, like, I, I would really like, I know Brian Moore uses it a lot. Um, John's throwing some more wet on the fire now, so I'm going to talk for a little bit. But uh, Brian will use maybe a 121 in the room, I think. Sorry, Brian, if you're listening, and I'm, I'm totally off on your, on your topic. But a 121 sounds great in the room. It'll get a nice room response. But at the same time there's a lot of definition that you're losing. Um, and a, a 57, as much as I personally do not like them, uh, 57 will compensate for that. It'll cover a lot of your high ends. It'll really make the guitar push through the mix in a sense that the ribbon can't make it. It'll, it'll, the ribbon will fatten it out a lot. Um, 
And what, what a lot of what people don't realize with ribbon mics is that it's a figure eight pattern. So if you throw it face right on the grill, even if you got one of the nicer ribbon mics, um, you're still picking up a lot of reverse room noise. So if you don't have a totally dead room, you're picking up a lot of room noise from the back of it that maybe you don't want. Um, and and beyond that, maybe, you know, on your console, it's it's not, ribbon mics aren't a pattern adjustable microphone, at least the ones that I've used. So you've got figure eight, you'll throw that maybe right on the grill cloth and you'll get from behind. So you want to turn it 90 degrees. So you're getting both sides of the speaker cabinet and then throw the 57 right on top of, or not on top of that, but maybe off to the, the side so you get the top end of the microphone um, and the top end of the guitar mix itself. Um, and after that, you can blend it back and forth, and you get a really nice, fat, fat guitar tone. Um, I I personally haven't used them a lot on bass, um, bass guitar amps or anything like that, but I've heard a lot of great things for... Um, especially room mics that we talked about before with Kevin Breshert and Brian Moore using it to Viking um, and Red Booth recording, especially where there's there's a certain sound where at a certain point in the room you want that ribbon mic because you want you don't want all the the bright splash of the symbol, but at the same time you want all of the response of it. Um, and sometimes it doesn't translate as well as you would you would hope it would. Um, I've heard a lot of nice things. I I wish I had the money to uh, to allow for me to buy <laughs> to buy a few sets of ribbon mics. Uh, the Royer 122s are nice; they're stereo room mics. So if I could do that and, and spread a couple out in my room, or even beyond that, as overhead mics. Um, sometimes when you lose or when you lose use large diaphragm condensers, um, you get a lot of really high overtones and splashes that you don't want in. I'm sorry, in, in the room mic itself or in the overhead. So the uh, the ribbon mics will compensate for that a lot and give you a lot more of a full overtone uh, of from the cymbals and from the whole entire kit than you would get uh, from just large diaphragm condensers or even small diaphragm condensers. Um, what I found ribbon mics to be really, really nice on, um, if you can get a singer that's consistent enough, to use them on their lead vocal track and then double that vocal track. So have them sing one pass. Uh, this is studio. Um, studio sound, sorry, for all the live listeners out there. But if you can get them to sing one pass on a ribbon mic, have them sing one pass on a large diaphragm or whatever vocal mic you prefer for them to use. Um, have them do that and then double that. If you can, as close to identical as you can with a, a ribbon mic, It'll really fatten out the sound. Maybe take it and, and pan it out um, really hard. See, you know, it, it's one of those things where you can you can pan it as hard as you want, but if it doesn't sound good, it doesn't sound good. So ribbon mics are something that you really need to work with, and if you're not terribly proficient with them, it's your first time out, use something that you're more, you're more comfortable with at first and then have them overdub with a ribbon mic. Um, and, and try it out. See, you know, if your drum sounds sound better with a ribbon mic in the room or with ribbon mics as overheads, um, it'll it'll take a lot of that that really harsh overtone out of the cymbals and out of the snare so you can use your close mics a little bit more. Cool. Yeah, I just remember two more shout-outs I want to do real quick. Uh, Gordon is out there on a, uh, a festival stage, one that we... I did years ago, uh, lost the contract for a while, and then uh, we just got the call back this year. So we're glad to have that little piece of business back, and uh, thanks for taking care of that one, Gordon. Hope you're having a blast out there on Main Street in Batavia. And uh, I want to thank Chachi, too. He's mixing for us in the theater this week. I don't know if I mentioned that before or not, but uh, Chachi had kind of a rough week, finally got all his problems solved, and he is back on top tonight as we record this. It's, uh, I don't even know what night it is. Saturday, I think it is? Okay. Um Today's today's Friday. It was what? Today's Friday. Uh, yeah, Philadelphia. <laughs> so the uh, what city are you in? <laughs> Orange. Yep. All right. Nate's next question, and uh, I gotta make another mark here. So, hey, think. All right. Um, Nate's next question was: How do you guys practice with gear at home if you don't have a studio? Like, how do you 
like play with your compressors or play with your equalizers to get more comfortable with them. Well, Nate, I don't. <laughs> I pretty much only ever try out gear at gigs, uh, which is easy for me to do because I do a lot of gigs. But uh, I don't know, back years ago, I mean, I learned probably my my initial quantum leap in learning to use gear was when I was in a band. So, like, yep. we had nothing but time. We had very little gear. So we would just jam seven nights a week, three, four, five hours. And as we accumulated gear, that was how we put it into service and practiced and got used to it. And if you're not able to do that, um, I know Sennheiser has them. I'm not sure. If Sh I think Sure has them, too. Um, Sennheiser and Sure are the two microphone companies that we use the most, I would say, at least for, for vocals and stuff. Drums are, are a different category, and that, that would take hours. But um, they do have frequency response charts on the microphones. So you can pull up, you know, a bunch of pop-up windows and look at them and see, you know, if, you're, if your singer is over-accentuates their S's, Maybe you want to pick a microphone that doesn't hit 6K as hard. Yep. Um, well, that's Anthony really hit on it. Um, read the manual. That's where we did. We still do a lot of our learning that way. We read manuals for stuff. You can read the manufacturer's propaganda, although you'll you'll get more out of the manual than you will the ads. Yep. And then hit the forums. See what other people are saying about them. Um, many a time, I have heard a piece of wisdom from another engineer, and it's basically makes the knowledge as good as mine. Like. Yep. You know, see somebody or, or even just hear of somebody like, oh, yeah, I always use a, a such and so on my snare underhead. So next time I'm somewhere that has one of those, I'm like, oh, yeah, give me that on the snare underhead. Like, say it like I know what I'm doing. And I get to right. the mix and <laughs> I hear it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, all right, that works. Figure and, it out. And, and, and after a while, you'll you'll build up your confidence on it. Like, I, I've got my go-to mics for, for snare top. I use an i5 or 57 all the time. And for underheads, I, I like to use a, a small diaphragm condenser to really grab the, the smack of it. Um, and it's usually an SM81 and that for that it's, it's a very typical mic. Um, most venues have it, um, or can get it very easily. So if they can get it and you're comfortable with it, um, if you're going in cold to something, it helps a lot to have something that you're familiar with. If you can, if you can familiarize yourself with enough gear and know what it's going to do, if you've got a copper shell snare. I know that I'm going to want an i5 instead of a 57. I've got a maple shell snare. I'm going to want a 57 instead of an i5. But I'm still going to want an 81 on the bottom uh, to get all that crack. Yep. And uh, something that pops to mind was like reverb units or effects processors. Um, yep. Once you learn how to run a couple of them, you pretty much got it in the bag. Um, and I don't know how many times. I, it was years before I actually learned how to drive an M1. I think they actually discontinued them before I actually went in and programmed a free yeah. set of my own. They, they've, but, they've got – it's it's like Yamaha – uh, NS10s and their whatever their new counterpart is. It's it's pretty close, so you can at least get a decent shot at what you're doing before you get yeah. cold into something brand new. But you know, if you if you learn how to run one effects box, then you learn how to run another one, and then you know, before long, pretty much whatever you run into here, there, and everywhere, you you're like, all right, well, I want I want less diffusion or something. You learn what the parameters are, and then all you got to do is dive into the box and find where they are. Um, same thing with consoles. You know, once you know how to use a couple, you you get the feel. You can get on a bigger one, and pretty soon, uh, you know, I'm at the point now where I can walk up to just about any console there is, and unless there's something really screwy about it or something screwy about the setup, I can pretty well get by. Other than actually, this week I, I called John on his day off, unfortunately, uh, and he sounded sick as a dog. But <laughs> but uh, I, it was uh, a yeah, sound... my day off. I got yeah. strep, so I got to lay on the couch. I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> um, it was it was a Soundcraft board. It was a, it was what was it? It was a Spirit Eight Forty. Which is typically a uh, a monitor desk, um, and I'm I'm not as familiar with British stuff as I should be. I was looking at everything. I was like, "Wow, there's M1 through M4 buttons," and I there's no sends. They're not matrix sends. They're not mix sends. There's no inserts on them. The hell do those do? And just totally missed my brain where the fact that M stands for mute. So I called John, and he's like, "Uh, yeah, they're mute." Your mood groups. I'm gonna go back to sleep now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that—that's what they were. And I was actually doing an install on a, a smaller system. It was—it was two um, two fifteens for the tops with horns, and then uh, an ungodly. It was—it was two eighteens per side for the subs, which is more than I've got in my room. And it seats about four times as many people, but. They got donated, so we... You we, can never have too much <laughs> sub-bass, really. They, they, like, we... Me and uh, my drummer, Brandon, 
uh, Brandon actually went and set up the room essentially to the the best that he could, and he got a phone call, and he had to go and mix salt and pepper at uh, nice at the the harbor shows in Glad Buffalo. They're still working, right? Yeah. So he he was actually got a couple photos from earlier today. He's mixing side stage, or not mixing, but uh, run monitor side stage and run a light show for him um, for a company that uh, we've used. I guess I don't want to get into it much more than that. We're not huge fans of them, but they supply a lot of sound sound in, in the, the greater Niagara region for us. But um, set all that stuff up and uh, turned out where the, the four mute groups are really, really nice for us. Because there were, you know, there's an intro part of the service. There's a worship part of the service, which is most of the music, a uh, an announcement set, and then a closing set. So pretty much with what whatever the sound engineer who was there could do was hit mute groups all the way through and then kill whatever he didn't need to do, which was nice because the acoustic guitar had this just great, awesome hum to it that you, <laughs> that you couldn't get rid of no matter what. <laughs> as, as expensive as they had, uh, what they had, they had radial J48s, I think, or a radial uh, Pro 48, whatever the lower end model, the radial, D, radial DIs was. Um, just It just didn't get rid of it. All right. Well, acoustic guitars reminds me that we need to get to Mike. Swing the focus over to Mike in Deutschland. Um, I don't know if I. I'd, I'll have to ask his permission. See if we can reprint some of the the letter. I'll I'll boil it down real quick. Um, he's a musician, singer songwriter. I would take it and plays guitar. And he is gigging it in pubs mostly. Yep. Where the sound is either sort of run by he he said the landlord, which is sort of the British term for bartender, and. Uh, or, you know, BYO, yep. and he needs to be, he has the joy of living in a European city where public transport is the mode. Um, I don't know if he even owns a car, he didn't say, but he's looking for a, a compact way to basically take care of his own stuff, and uh, he hit upon, he, he's really a lot of the way there, like the stuff he said was great. Um, you know, he said, it seems like if you're an acoustic guitar player and you're going to play plugged in, you need to have exactly what you want coming out of the jack. Yep, and or, it's, that or the, it's not going to be there. Yep, and whether you're the sound guy or somebody else is, be like, listen, it, th this is my stuff. It sounds just like that. Just go. Make it as easy as you can on them. Um, so I'm going to turn Anthony loose in a minute and and let him go off on a number of ways that you can do that. And it, it sounds like uh, from the email, he said he had been doing some things like flipping phase to sort vocals and, um, and guitar sounds out, his two inputs, which... I don't know. I'd kind of advise against, although if it's the only thing you've got, it's the only thing it's, you've got. You've got to work with it. Yep. Um, the thing that pops to my mind, and I'm just a huge fan of them right now, is you know a small powered speaker with two inputs. Um, my little QSC K10s, I pop a mic on channel one and a guitar on channel two. There's no EQ on it, but there sort of doesn't need to be. Like, if you have a good guitar and a good mic. It's, it's true enough to the input signal where you don't need yeah. a whole ton of stuff. Yeah, it's pretty clean. Although, you know, if you want to do some more stuff, um, you could get a long ways with pedals. I would suggest, you know, a compressor pedal or, a you know, a small half-rack mountable uh, compressor. The RNC comes to mind, which stands for really nice compressor. It's not a <laughs> mind-blowingly good compressor. It's just just a really nice compressor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of stuff around, some compact stuff you could get. Um, putting some compression on really helps an acoustic guitar, but... You need to twiddle the knobs around uh, to get it so that you're not murdering the sound, squashing it. Um, I would say, I usually, when I'm compressing acoustic guitar, uh, I like a, a fast attack time because I don't want stuff to really get away. Um, I like to let the transients through so you don't lose that sparkle of the, the pick sounds. Yep. Um, so I don't know, what's what's a 30, 40 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds? Of maybe, release uh, time? Let, no, of, of attack of time. Attack time. I'll, I'll let the attack go a little bit. And then release time pretty fast, too. Like, probably not more than 150 milliseconds. Right. And probably a good deal shorter than that. Because um, if you go too far, like, you can get <laughs> electric guitar-type sustain out of an acoustic guitar if you really slam it. Yeah. And maybe that's an effect. Like, I don't know, you control it with a foot switch you, or something. You play it off the feedback, too. Like, there's there's certain stuff, especially in, in the lower frequencies, below 500 hertz, That'll just carry, and you, you can work off of that, or it can be your worst nightmare. Yep. Um, something else I like to do, too, I mean, it, it depends a little bit on what you want out of the voicing, but, you know, if, if I was going out, if I was doing what he was doing, um, 
I would almost do it with a computer. I mean, with a little interface, you can do a, a just a ton of processing, even on a little netbook. Yep. Um, you know, if you had a netbook and you know we got this little ART USB interface, it costs fifty bucks. Plug in a mic, plug in a guitar, get into a, a DAW or like the focus rate stuff is great. It comes, yeah, you know, comes what, with some plugins. Get too. Yep. Um, you know, but then you basically have as big a console as you want. I mean, if you want to shell out for fancy plugins, you can. But what that allows you to do is really get in there and sculpt your sound. Um, if you have a great guitar and you're really happy with what's coming out of the jack, then more power to you. But uh, even with that, if you get into a room that just has some resonance at 200, you might not want that in your voice or your guitar, or you might want it in one and not the other so they don't fight. Um, it's good to sculpt the sound and sort of decide what fits where. And when there's only two inputs, it's a lot easier job. You know, you can say, all right, well, I know my voice is going to be in there from like, you know, 300 up through, you know, 1.5K, 2.5K, and let, let the guitar be there some, but less in that middle region and let the guitar occupy the lower notes and the higher notes and sort of coexist like that. And that one of, one of I, I hate absolute, like, since they put out X and Y, I haven't been able to listen to Coldplay, but one of the really one of the, <laughs> one of the really great things that um, my friend Elliot told me a long time ago, he's like, listen, when you listen to Coldplay, when his vocal melody is down low, his piano part is up high, and vice versa. He's like, they don't they don't exist in the same space. Everything else is is totally separate from that. But if he's singing down low, his piano part is up high. So that's 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 more of a musicality thing where if if you can if you can deal with it and you can you can adjust to it play your chords a little bit higher throw a capo on if you really need to i i i really detest capos cuz i feel if if you if you know your instrument well enough you don't you don't need a capo but if if you need a capo um play up higher and sing down low and then alternate what you're doing because if you're if you're occupying the same frequency space all the time, it's going to sound pretty much like white noise the whole way through. You're not going to get any difference, any uh, any dynamic response really to your your music or whatever show you're putting out. So that's an interesting thought. Yeah, to to sculpt your playing around things, that could really make you a better player if you're if you're constantly working one off the other. Or um, that that goes back to the whole ribbon mic thing, really. Like all those guys back in the day, they knew when to play and when not to play. Yep. That was if you knew it wasn't, you know, maybe the trombone player didn't need to solo the entire time. He knew when to lay back, and it wasn't a problem for him. He knew that it wasn't his time to shine. He was laying down rhythm. Yep. Yeah, a good band definitely mixes itself pretty near. Um, but then, too, you know, if, if your focus is the singing and, and the guitar is the, just the rhythmic instrument and the backup, uh, you know, mix accordingly or play accordingly. Lay back on your plane. Don't dig in as much. Um, you know, but set yourself up so that when you do head for a solo, you can dig in and, and bring that out and make right. it shine a little more. Um, EQ-wise, though, the the area, like the, the top tip, the, the pro tip here, um, the biggest problem I have with acoustic guitars and pianos too, whether it's real piano or uh, you know a synth, is in the three to five or maybe six hundred hertz range. Um, you know those frequencies are going to fight with the meat and potatoes of a vocal and, and everything also, else, really. Yeah, and are also fairly likely to not really cause feedback in a room, just because uh, those it's it's less likely that you would get feedback at those frequencies, but just to, to have build-up, you know, have this sort of unpleasant, twangy, just it, boxy it, it sound. It sounds, it sounds boomy. It, that's that's where the boom comes from. If, if you got a kick drum and you're accentuating all the way up from 50 hertz to, you know, 5,000 hertz, and you've got a snare that's kicking through at 200 hertz, and you've got a vocal that's coming through from 2... 60 or, or even 250 all the way up to, to 15k that's that's a lot of stuff in the same the same region that's what i what i really appreciate about dave rat's mixing style where he'll split his sound system and it's it's way above where we're at money wise really but he'll run vocals and he'll run he'll run vocals on one mix and all the instruments on another so the vocals will still cut through regardless of what's going on in the music but you can still push them enough where they're not occupying the same space with the same speaker line as all the instruments. And it makes it makes the whole mix a lot clearer if you can do that. And that goes to something, too, where um, I actually just watched a uh, Dave Rat video where he shows how 
things interact in the same speaker. Um, not that you necessarily, Michael, need to go out and, and buy one set up for your speaker and one for your vocal, although, a, you know, an amp, a nice tube amp for your guitar and a, a nice powered pole speaker for your vocal might be a great way to go. Um, you know, what you get, uh, the high frequencies coming from a particular driver will be affected by the low frequencies coming out of it. So if you think of that like, I'm going to try and do this demonstration here. This may not be pretty, folks, but if you sing a high note, like, ah, uh, and then a picture if I'm a speaker producing that note, and then a low note is played through that same speaker, and this is going to be exaggerated, but you get, ah, and I was just sort of, <laughs> thanks. That's why I'm behind the mix, folks, not in front of it. Um, <laughs> but uh, y you can hear how, you know, a, a sort of like picture of, uh, like AM radio, you have your carrier wave, that's the low frequencies, and then the higher frequencies riding on that. Uh, this is why speakers have multiple drivers in them, so the highs aren't affected as much by the lows. And if you can separate them completely out, then you get perfectly clear highs and perfectly clear lows. And, of course, then you get into issues where uh, you can have differences in arrival time. Uh, you can still have all sorts of interactivity issues. But, you know, if you have a nice clear vocal coming out of one speaker and a nice rich guitar coming out of another speaker, you, you should have a pretty good shot at, uh, you know, not having the two interfere with each other as much mix wise you might still have issues in your room if one's on the floor and one's up in the air but um yeah without going too far down that road let's see i'm gonna check the time here real quick because my screen went dark again macbook pro holding up great i must say battery feeding phantom power to these two or two vocal mics like a champ all right we got a little bit of time left um Anthony here is just a wealth of guitar knowledge, so I'm going to turn it over to him a little bit. Um, some things that Michael could do specifically relating to his guitar, and unfortunately I don't know, I, I should have asked him uh, when I responded to his email, um, you know, what he's using. It's, you know, he's plugging in, so, he, you know, he's got an, a, an acoustic guitar, theoretically a fairly nice one, hopefully with a, a good pickup in it, like a Fishman, or uh, even better, one of these uh, hybrid setups. It's got a, a piezo pickup in the bridge and also a microphone inside the body that you can blend back and forth. Yep. Kind of the best of both worlds. Um, but what for, for optimization, um, and I'll, I'll kind of start the ball rolling on this where I'd, where I'd sort of like it to go, and I'll let you pick up and run with it wherever you'd like. Okay. I've seen guitar players struggle and struggle and struggle with an instrument that wasn't built to do what they want it to do. Like female... Uh, I, I mixed a pair of sisters one time who were both playing guitars and strings that were just not at all suited for what they were doing. You know, like they had uh, these great big guitars, like almost dreadnought, like bigger yeah. than full-size guitars with silk and steel strings on them. So like very, very light gauge low strings <laughs> and even lighter gauge high strings. Uh -huh. <laughs> like they just, they needed this really delicate sound to go along with, with two fairly delicate ethereal voices and they weren't getting it. Um, and the same thing, too. You'll see, like, some kids sitting in a coffee shop with a three-quarter scale beginner guitar trying to bang out, you know, like, really meaty chords and not getting them out of a, a puny instrument. So um, it may be something as simple as changing your strings and experimenting with that until you find a, a sound that is what you want and that complements whatever else is going along with it. Yep. Um, you know, I would say if, if you're, a get, you know, I'm going to talk about a band a little bit as opposed to just a, you know, a singer songwriter with an, a guitar and a microphone. You know, if, when I'm mixing acoustic guitar with my bands at church, sometimes I'll have two on stage and I take almost no bottom out of them. I, I yeah, mentioned this, uh, my intro said to me, like, wow, those sound really high. I'm like, yeah, I, I high passed them really high. Uh, and I'll mm -hmm. roll that back. You know, if it's going to be a solo acoustic guitar during communion or something, I'll put some bottom back on there. So it's a, a full spectrum thing, but to sit in a mix where I've got, kick drum and bass and organ sounds and, and vocals and all sorts of other things filling up the bottom range. I don't need the meat from a, an acoustic guitar. I just want, you know, some strumming, some string sounds and some of the higher notes. So that's what I, I go for getting out of them. Um, so uh, instrument setup wise, what do you got for us, Anthony? Um, personally, I use, I've got a Tacoma, um, what is it, J50C or JK50C, which doesn't have a microphone in it at all it's a it's a pretty pricey acoustic guitar um if you ever heard of or listened to phil keggy he he um aside from his olsen guitars this is one of the mass-produced guitars that he uses it's a uh it's a sicka spruce top and um hawaiian koa back inside so it, it projects great i i love using it just mic'd up but 
There's no microphone inside of it. For as expensive a guitar as it is, it's just got a Fishman Prefix Plus pickup um, in the piezo position in the bridge. Um, and that that helps out a ton with, with feedback problems. You know, you can adjust, like, really what I do is I set everything flat and bump the presence up just a touch and notch out probably around, I think it bottoms out at 250. I'll notch out around 250 to 300. So when you leave low strings ringing, um, it doesn't ring. It, it'll ring, but it doesn't overpower everything else. Yep. Something else that just came to mind, uh, you were talking about, you know, resonating and stuff. Um, something I would highly recommend for any guitar player who's going to take his ex out on stage especially if there are going to be wedges there. Uh, but maybe, you know, I, I'm pretty lucky. I have a carpeted stage, a pretty, a fairly dead room. Right. Um, most of my musicians are on in-ear monitors, so I don't have as much volume on stage, and therefore I don't make my guitar players use these. But uh, a sound hole plug will go a long way. Yeah. Um, it doesn't modify the sound of the instrument too much, particularly if you're plugged in. But what it will do is just a, a rubber plug. You can buy them in different sizes, yeah. different they, sound holes. They even have ones that are cut in different shapes now. Uh, unfortunately, I don't like to bring up the reference, but uh, Taylor Swift uses them a lot. And they've got different shapes cut out and all it kind of designs and stuff. But what it does is it, it'll cut out those awful resonant frequencies that you, you really can't get rid of without getting rid of the meat of the guitar. Yep. And it, it keeps your guitar from resonating at the frequencies that the PA is putting out, uh, but without modifying it sound too much uh and you can fake it too i mean if you if you can't afford that it's like they're about eight bucks i think or 12 yeah. maybe but you know if, if you forget it or don't have one or for whatever reason uh three four pieces of gaff tape duct tape over the sound hole will do in a pinch uh you really just need yep. to keep those those low notes from getting back into the guitar and resonating in there and then coming back out of the PA, jumping back into the guitar. It's a vicious cycle. Especially if you got a big, giant guitar like the the Tacoma that I use for it, like I, I call it the money guitar because it doesn't leave the gear room at my house unless it's getting paid to leave the gear room at my house. <laughs> like my my wife has a, a nice little Martin guitar, which is, um, they're not that expensive. I think she got hers for like 1200 bucks uh, American, and it's got a great piezo pickup. It's a smaller body, but it doesn't resonate like mine does because mine's literally almost twice the size of her guitar. And if I'm playing on a big stage, I'll play hers because chances are if I'm playing acoustic guitar, I'm getting paid to go out and play somewhere. Acoustic guitar is not the lead instrument. They want it there for a, a few specific notes here and there, but it's not the driving force of the song. It's not ever just me and acoustic guitar. If it is, then the money guitar comes back into it. And I was actually going to mention that, like, different brands. I mean, uh, we talked about experimenting with, you know, different strings and different setups. Uh, the Martins tend to... I was going to go, like, the Martin-Taylor difference. Um, first yeah. of all, I've never heard a Taylor plugged in and sound bad. Like, you can always get something decent out of a Taylor. As long as they set it up flat. If you, What my big problem with Taylors currently is they've got this expression that's air quotes, if you're listening. Um, oh, on the little built-in expression, controls, right. yeah. And that's, it's different than the Fishman stuff. I've never heard one that sounded good. I really haven't. Like, not something that would make me jump and be like, I need to go and buy the guitar right now. Um, right. No, it's definitely not, in, not in, the be-all, end-all. But the, you plug in a Taylor, you're getting something decent out of it. Right, you're getting a Taylor. And what, what I've really noticed about stuff is that if it's a really good guitar, they don't put controls on it. Right. They don't. Those are the <laughs> tailors that I'm thinking right. of in particular. The, yeah. the real high end, especially my 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 wet dream of an acoustic guitar is a Gibson SJ200 or a J200. Um, you plug it in, and that's it. There's no, you can't screw with it. Done. Sounds like angels made it. It does. Right. That That's what it sounds like is what it sounds like. You don't screw with it. And there's, um, there's a, a defunct company out of Ireland, actually, called Avalon Guitars. They're the same way. There's, oh, yeah. you know, if if you listen to them, you like when we've got a guitar player at church that has an Avalon that was custom built for him, and it's drop dead gorgeous. Like I, I would take it out to dinner and call it afterwards, gorgeous. Um, but there are no controls on it. You plug the cord in, and you turn the EQ off because it's it's so naturally perfect that you shouldn't screw with it. So when I was, uh, what is it, the the Taylor versus Martin thing. Was it Martins are a little fuller and Taylors are a little more yeah, on the high end? Yeah, Taylor, like, I've heard different stuff either way. 
I've heard a lot of stuff where Taylors have a, a fatter bottom end, but it's more controllable. Personally, I like I like Martins better than Taylors. I just it, it, it's it's this weird cyclical thing where you, like if you go back through music, Martins were the thing for a long time. You you watch or listen to any of the Led Zeppelin stuff. Um, Jimmy Page played a Martin, or even way back, he played a Harmony acoustic guitar, which I had when I was growing up, and that's what I learned how to play on. That's geographic stuff, too, though, when you get right. back that far. Right, but you, you move on, and then I can't remember who it was, if it was Sarah McLaughlin or Dave Matthews or whatever, but you got into something a little bit higher, and you're like, oh, Taylor's sound really great. And everyone switched to Taylor's because everyone thought they sounded really great. And then there was the rise of, I'm going to say it, the Takamini. Yep. Oh, yeah. That, the, <laughs> the Dead or Alive video did more for their Freaking business. 90s. Ugh. <laughs> and I got to say, like, as, as many times as I've heard somebody plug in a Taylor and it sounds great, I shudder when I see a Takamini coming my way. Yeah, Garth Brooks isn't the, the, the end all. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's, uh, there's a lot of fantastic boutique stuff around here, too. And, and that's just a matter of, you know, you pay a lot of money for a guitar, your chances of getting something crappy sounding go way, way down. Um, I've heard Bougeot's that just, well, like Anthony's got yeah, just the make you bourgeoisie. Weep. Is that how you say? It? He says it Bougeot, but I. However. It's it's spelled out bourgeoisie. Yeah. Like if you if you're listening in America, it's spelled out bourgeoisie. If like, you want to hear in a your history guitar class. to make the angels weep, look up uh, relevant word. Uh, I don't know if it'd be on there. Anyway, the relevant worship the old, stuff that he was playing in. Yep. It might yeah. be kind of showcased in that stuff. I think you can find it on iTunes. And then the band it's he's on in YouTube, now is YouTube, even. Yeah, look on YouTube. Uh, the Brothers McClurg is his current band. He's he's still playing that. Uh, Darren that we, that I work with and that uh, Anthony is so fond of has one. Uh, it's a Lanyons. Yeah, I've uh, never heard of him until I saw his. And oh boy, that's that's why it makes a Taylor you, sound like he has a Taylor on stage ready to go at all times just right. in case. But boy, that Lanyons yeah. makes it sound like a the Lanyons or the he's got he's got some gorgeous old vintage Martins and. Uh, what is uh, Mark got some Laravee guitars, mm-hmm. and they sound fantastic. And all of those guitars, you can't screw with. You just plug them in. Yeah, <laughs> and that like that's what it comes back to. If you've got a guitar that you can screw with, if it sounds good natural, leave everything flat. Yeah. Maybe Don't like mess. I'll I'll touch the presence fader just a touch up just to get a little bit more high end definition. But other than that. I, I leave it alone because it. I know how it sounds, and I've recorded it in a room with large diaphragms, ribbons, small diaphragms, everything you can imagine, and it sounds good. So, yeah, that kind of went the long way around the block. Um, but, yeah, if you can get something good coming out of the jack, hitting the DI box, by and large, a sound guy, whether he's good or bad, is probably going to start with the EQ. There's a pretty good shot. He's starting with the EQ straight up. And if there aren't too many issues with the room or his rig... You've got a good shot at, at your unmodified sound coming right out. And, right. you know, maybe he has some predispositions and he's going to automatically do such and so to a, a guitar. But, you know, I, I, I do the same thing. It, it doesn't matter what it is. Pretty much almost anything. I I start at 500 and just knock that sucker right down. doesn't matter if it's vocals, guitars. Yeah. yeah. Five, 500 goes Especially away. in the room I'm mixing. I, I do right. that a lot, too. My room has bad issues between three and, and 600. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll always give it an input, whatever it is, a listen with the EQ straight up. I try to anyway. Sometimes time doesn't allow. And, you know, if you're going bang, bang, bang from act to act, you kind of yep. go with what it is and change it if it needs to. But. I like to, when there's time, give everything a fair listen, and if it doesn't need to be touched, I don't touch it. Um, and I did that even before I was a good sound guy. Um, you just you got to have your starting point. Although, you, I don't know, you can't, <laughs> some some of the guys in our trade can't really be counted on to have your best interest at heart. So your best bet, though, is to, to give, them, give them the best you've got and hope they treat it well. Yep. So, all right, I'm going to check on the time here again. Now we're getting close. We got a few more minutes. All right. Well, I, I can get into uh, some acoustic guitar treatment. I Go guess. ahead. Um, what what Mike had, had suggested was if, if there were any compressors or any any anything along those lines that that could help him out. Um, in me and John did some research during the week. Um, what I found that I like a lot that's really great for acoustic guitar, especially sculpting wise. Um, there's an LR Bags DI. I think it's called the Paracoustic DI. You use them. Oh, yeah. Um, and they they really do fantastic things. Even if you leave them just straight up, they just, the guitar comes out. 
if your guitar is not good, it'll bring out the guitar that's not good. But you can you can sculpt them either way. Um, and if it comes down to it, where you've got a guitar that doesn't plug in LR bags, L period R period bags um, has some great uh, sound hole pickups. They've got a single coil, a humbucker, and all kinds of stuff. And that really that'll get rid of a lot of the feedback issues that you've got. Um, and get you a, a gorgeous guitar sound. I, I'll use one on top of miking my guitar. Um, I'll come back to Phil Keggy again. He's got, no joke, twenty, thirty thousand dollar acoustic guitars made for him, custom made by James Olson of Olson Guitars. And if you can find one of those, you're you are a lucky son of a bitch, is what it comes down to. Um, but you have to, you gotta pay him like three or four grand up front and he'll finish the guitar for you and stuff but what he'll do is he'll throw one of those in his guitar there's a pickup in his guitar and then he'll mic it five different ways so on one acoustic guitar track he'll have seven or eight inputs like I've I've done drum tracking sessions that require less inputs than that <laughs> but his guitar sounds gorgeous if, if you if you got the time um, one of the the fantastic albums that I've I've never run away from my entire life is Phil Keggy's acoustic sketches. It's just him and acoustic guitar and some microphones and maybe a loop every here and there, but he makes the loop. Um, and there's no feedback issues. There's no over resonant issues. Um, and I'm sure a lot of it has to do with some processing. There's a, a helicopter in the background somewhere. Sorry about that people. Um, but, uh, Joe Meek actually came out with a really nice... I really like optical compressors on acoustic guitars. Um, tube compressors seem to get a little bit warm, um, and they sound great in the studio, but on a live on a live setting, Joe Meek has come out with... I think it's called a floor cue. Um, it's either... They've got a couple different sizes, but you can notch out different frequencies um, and sculpt it by there. They're about 300 bucks American, uh, and they, they sound fantastic. They... The, the the nice thing about the optical compressors is that it's a very clean tone. So if your guitar sounds really great, you want it to sound really clean going to the board. If you're doing, like Mike's doing, acoustic singer-songwriter type stuff, um, maybe there's some stuff that you really want to come through, and there's some stuff that you don't. If if you're playing on a on a scale that your your ability as a, a guitar player comes through it doesn't hurt to, to tame those certain frequencies and, and compress stuff that you don't need. They've got, I think it was, it's a, there's the floor cue in there. I think there's a tri floor cue, which is a little bit more money. Um, but it keeps it really clean. It's a, it's not real noisy. Like the, the twin cue that you've got, John is, it gets noisy every yep. once in a while. Like it's, that's what it does, but it's a photo optical compressor. And that's you know that when you're going into it. Um, but the floor cue is really nice. It'll it'll keep all your stuff in bounds, and uh, it'll still let you be able to get a little bit louder and, and and play with some dynamics instead of playing straight solid all the way through the whole thing and uh, just getting the same volume and, and same dynamic out of everything. Yep. And here's a thought to keep in mind too. Um, it's common to think of EQ as EQ and dynamic processing as dynamic processing. But really, compression is also EQ. Um, yep. if, if you, for example, if you're playing acoustic guitar through a compressor and you have a lot of those mid-tones coming through, the compressor is going to want to act more often when you're playing those mid-notes notes and bring them out more. Um, so keep that in mind. If, if that's your style of playing and those are the notes that are coming out, or if you get a lot of bottom notes out, the compressor is going to bring those out. Um, so think of it as, as magnifying whatever is most prominent in your playing, and maybe you want to EQ a little first to maybe make some make things either be more even or to feature something else. Um, right. But whatever whatever you compress, and and that's not you know even getting into you know what a tube compressor is going to add its warmth to your sound. An optical compressor is going to lend some characteristics to, even when it's not working. Like even if you plug it in and bypass it that, they're still going to get the that channel strip itself does a lot of work right you got a, an input transformer or a differential input whatever method it's using to get sound into the box and whatever output circuitry it has that's going to lend some shaping and sculpting to the sound um, i know a lot of guys that not so much guys that mix records but guys that master records will run 
and it's it's a completely different ball game. But you know, they're using speakers that you can hear stuff that you know dogs couldn't hear on headphones. And they have, you know, their single piece of gear is worth more than my whole rig. But, <laughs> or yeah, house. Even, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, they'll run something through, uh, I'm trying to think of a name here. Like, Fairchild. Yeah, like through a Fairchild with it turned off. like well, Not not powered off, but like w- with they just, all the knobs straight up. Yep. Just to get that Fairchild-ness yep. in and there. there I, I watched a few videos of uh, John, or Jack, Joseph, Jack Joseph Puig. Where they've got this awesome Waves has an awesome plug. Flex every time he says that name, you, you can't see that because <laughs> uh, it's radio. Uh, but there, there's stuff like you know he's gone through stuff where they'll adjust the voltage by one volt to see how it, it, it's different. Um, and he's got some awesome plugins. The the Fairchild six seventy and uh, or six sixty and six seventy are fantastic. But just running through that turned off it adds a different characteristic like what i what i really like doing is is uh when i track drums through john's joe me twin q i'll turn the compressors off on both strips how is joe by the way I haven't seen him in a while. joe is real good <laughs> <laughs> he's doing he's doing very well i i feed him twice a day Getting a lot of work yeah <laughs> but the channel strip itself like there's there's a lot to be said about exterior channel strips even even dave rat um what he'll do is because he's got tons of money and he can do it because he's an awesome bastard. Um, he'll mix on Midas desks, but he'll route everything to a Focusrite pre before because he likes the way the Focusrite pre sounds better than a Midas pre. And I don't understand that because Midas pre's sound like they're from the angels. You want to rub them on your gums. He, and other stuff. Um, I'd rub them on all kinds of things. <laughs> Just rub on them like a cat. <laughs> But they sound gorgeous, but still there's, you know, when, when you get into it and you've been doing it for a while, there's stuff that sounds better. I've actually, I picked up a, uh, a Focusrite Scarlet 8i6. Does it si- come with a little, can you mix on that thing? Did it come yeah. with mixing software? Yeah. It's, uh, so there you go. I, I can for, do eight bus, or for, I'm sorry, eight inputs. For 300 bucks, you can get a, a little box that plugs into your USB port with two kick-ass mic pre's in it, as well as jacks to plug in other things. Yep. And Control you, it with your computer, use the output jacks to feed your PA, and you've got a digital desk with great mic pre's on it. And it, it sounds gorgeous. You, can, you know, like it was under 300 bucks, actually. It was, it was 220 or something like that. But you can get up to the, the I think there are Sapphire pre's and stuff where you can buy a box for less than 500 bucks, and it's got eight Focusrite pre's in it. And there's, I, I don't exactly know how to explain it, but they just, they sound better. They really do than almost, I, I would say 90% of the stuff that you use for less than 500 bucks, you run your whole, your whole system through it. Even if it's just a, a, a two bus out to your mains, run it through that. And it just, it sounds gorgeous. It sounds fuller. It sounds fatter. It sounds more dynamic. It sounds more musical than it would normally sound. All right, so checking the time again. I think we got to probably wrap it up here. Yeah, we're we're going to make this one not the longest SNR podcast ever. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, we hope, Michael, that uh, we didn't talk in too many circles and that that was some help to you. And if it wasn't, by all means, write us back and ask for clarification. Oh, um, the one thing I wanted to get into with, with at least, I don't know what your budget's like, Mike, but um, there's uh, I did some, some research on some solid body, or not solid body, but pseudo solid body guitars. Um, the Godin Multiac guitar is a pseudo solid body guitar. It's a mahogany chambered acoustic guitar that's got a gorgeous preamp on it, but it doesn't lend itself to feedback at all because it's it's more of a solid body. So if it's if you're in a room where where feedback is an issue at certain frequencies, um, even just go and play one, and see what it sounds like to you. Um, I've mixed a few shows, the couple guys that use them, and it makes me want to throw my four thousand dollar acoustic out the door, and it only costs fifteen hundred bucks. Um, it sounds natural, it sounds clear. There's no feedback. All the transients come through the way you want it to, but it's. You know, if if that's something that you're gonna make some money off of, it's it's not a bad chance to make an investment on that, um, and some floor compressors and, and stuff like that. But uh, beyond that, back to John. All right. So to wrap it up, uh, in summary, I would say uh, from start to back, start with a guitar that gives you what you want coming out. 
Uh, spend some time with an EQ and with a compressor. If the cheapest and easiest way to do that is getting a little USB interface, uh, that can save you a lot of heartache, uh, especially if you're able to use a, a DAW. A Reaper, for instance, is free. Yep. Pretty easy to use, pretty well supported, pretty robust. Comes with some good plugins, and it'll use uh, VST and AU plugins. Uh, so if you want to shell out and get some some more interesting, if you know if the compressors and EQs in there aren't doing it for you, uh, if you get a focus right, that comes with some nice plugins. But at any rate, um, mm-hmm. get some tools. You don't necessarily need to run out and spend tons of money filling up a rack full of gear. Keeping in mind that Michael's issue is he needs to get there in a taxi, uh, or possibly uh, I don't know if he ever takes the train or the bus or whatever. But he needs he needs it small, compact, com- uh, compact, and portable. So uh, a couple of QSC K10s and uh, a little bit of digital processing. Or even just one. I mean, if it's small pubs, right? Um, you know, one good powered speaker, uh, Mayer makes some amazing boxes. I mean, you I, spend some money on them. I, I try to forget about them because it makes yeah. me cry inside. But, uh, you know, stay away from the lower end stuff, the Yamaha, the PV. Everybody's making a powered speaker now. They're not all good. The QSCs, <laughs> I, they're not the most wonderful boxes in the world. I've got a handful of them, and I, I plan on buying more. Uh, they're adequate. Uh, de- more than adequate, I would say, actually. They're, they're a pretty good box. Especially would... for what Michael's trying to do. Yep, like, I... I've, I've got the K152s and the K10, and the K10 is more than enough. Yep. I just heard some K12s recently. They did a bang-up job, mixed a whole band in a yep. tent uh, on a pair of K12s. They had a bunch of subs under them, too, but they, they were doing from 120 hertz on up for four guys banging away at rock music uh, in a, I don't know, 500-person venue. Worked great. Um, so I can recommend QSCs with a clear conscience. And, uh, As can I. Good vocal mic, too. Um, see if you can find a place that will rent you a mic or, you know, a place that has a good return policy and try different stuff. Uh, see what suits your voice well. But, uh, uh, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> you like. have to spend some time reading the blogs, reading the posts and uh, in forums and stuff. You know, find some, some of the twiddly things, read those posts, that, you know, twiddle the knobs until it does this and, and feels better. But. Uh, I, really, the the big thing is to get to know your gear. I go through this with electric guitar players all the time. Uh, I always quote that you know hypothetical guitar player that buys a Fender Telecaster and a Tweed amp and goes, "There, I sound like Stevie Ray Vaughan." Yep. You don't. When, <laughs> you in, when, when in all reality, Stevie Ray Vaughan played through a Strat and a 15 inch speaker, or whatever it is. Yeah, what, whatever. But you know, uh, you you can't buy whatever box or widget or amp that your idol plays and sound like them. Uh, they sound the way they do one because <laughs> they're 15 tracks wide in a really good room on really good equipment. I, I sounded just like Stevie Ray Vaughan with a Marshall MG10 and a Strat in my bedroom with my headphones on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, the big thing is, uh, you know, I see guys with big pedal boards and I wish they would just take some time, unplug it all, plug the guitar straight into the amp and get to know the amp, get to know how the guitar works with the amp, yeah. how the amp responds. Um, and that, that preamp out power amp in section really helps a lot. If, if that's something that you got on your amp, plug your guitar straight in the amp and then run the preamp out into your pedals and then out of the pedals back in the power amp in. Yep. And it, it opens up a whole new, I, I've had, um, Pants changing experiences, uh, where where I've done just that. <laughs> I wonder if that translates into the German, into the mother tongue. Everybody can change their pants. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so good. I had to change my pants. All right. I've got a lot of pants in my Somebody car. Say amen. Amen. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so it, we tried to keep it simple there, starting from you know from start to finish. But I guess the 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 overall advice is. Get the best stuff you can. Keep it as simple as you can, so you can uh, not, you know, the less stuff you have to screw up, the better. But also give yourself as many options as you can. Uh, so that, you know, with that, you know, if you already got to carry your guitar and a backpack with your extra strings and stuff, and you, if you can jam a laptop and an interface in there, and that does it for you, then uh, your other hand's holding your powered speaker, and and you're on the in the taxi, and off you go. Yeah, I've, I've done tons of shows like that, just acoustic shows. Yep. Me and one of the guitar player and a microphone, and it's it's turned out just fine. So you're set if you show up and the house sound is inadequate, or maybe the house sound is fine, but you need a monitor. Boom, your your powered speaker goes on the floor in front of you. Don't worry, sir. I'll take care of my own monitor mix. And uh, you know, so anyway, uh, th- you know, as you're putting stuff together, read those manuals. Learn learn signal routing is the big thing. That's where the flexibility comes in to be able to think at a moment's notice. Oh, I'm gonna take my stuff apart and patch it together this way tonight. Um, I've been using, well, I actually just sold my rig, but I've been using the same gear, some of it, for almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, put it together different almost every night. Even going into the same room, put it together different. Just to... that, that builds your chops. If you, if you 
almost if you disadvantage yourself going in, that makes you a better sound person, better musician, all that kind of stuff. If you, if you willingly disadvantage yourself to what you know, it'll make you better. Yep. And uh, one thing I will say is I have run into a bunch of these singer-songwriters, and they've got the computer, and they've got their little Mackie console, and they've got their own mics and their own <laughs> stuff, and they will not trust me. Like, despite having been to a bunch of shows that I've mixed, will not trust me with yep. anything but a mono feed of their mix. And it's like, all right, well, I, I would have made that fit the room better, but since you know better than me, I guess you, you get to have your guitar be 6 dB louder than your vocal the whole time. Yep. Whatever. Oh, yeah. You know? So, um... <laughs> It's, it is tough to trust sound guys because not all of them are trustworthy. Uh, so you do want to try and bulletproof your mix or your setup, you know, so that you have as much control as you can. Um, some of it's also going to be psychology and, and public relations, getting to know your sound guy, trying to make friends with him quick and get him to trust you, get so you can trust him and, and yep. work together. And, uh, you know. There's, there's a lot to say about having a, a, a consistent sound guy. Like, they're... There are, there are lots of bands, like even me and John have mixed bands before, that we're the sound guys. And whenever they go out, we're the sound guys. Um, and it, 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 it creates a sense of camaraderie, camaraderie I'm sorry, um, that you don't get going into a room cold every night. Yep, and those geeks are heaven to mix. I mean, yep. we, we can make suggestions to them, and they listen, and it makes their playing better. It makes it easier for us to give them good sound. They make requests of us, and we bend over backwards to do it for them if we're able. And uh, it does a lot for their confidence level, i got to say. Like, I've had this said to me, like, to know that, you know, like, I'll, I'll tell people, uh, you know, they'll ask, hey, John, can you do this for us? And I'll, I'll get this look on my face. And they're like, no, 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 if you can't do it, it's not a big deal. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not saying no. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 not a, it's not a no, it's a give me a second. Yep. And so it, it, it works out uh, from the sound guy's perspective, and this goes back to the lesson in customer service. You know, I, I, I try to not ever say no. I try to find a way to say yes, even if it's inconvenient for me, because I want to put my musicians at ease and let them not worry about the tech and let them have a good night. <laughs> Usually it's wildly inconvenient. <laughs> yeah. But that's why they pay me the big bucks. That's why I live yeah. in a mansion and drive a Maserati. Wait a minute. <laughs> where, hmm, that's that's where, why I live in a 20-year-old farmhouse and you drive a minivan with 160,000 miles on it. Mm, I rent. <laughs> <laughs> but But if I was independently wealthy i would still be doing this so uh you know well anyway i was going to say so i'd like to say this if you run into a sound guy who's like us guys that care and and guys who are willing to do it for you um you know if we're busy try and get a minute with us and and try and you know let us know where you're coming from and what you got and we'll work with you our our brethren of the knob and fader out there who are at, of jedi status um and if you get a guy who doesn't care if he's going to sound check you and then go out in the alley and smoke a joint if it's that kind of guy uh if you have to get his attention by buying him a beer, be like, hey, listen, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about my set tonight. Can I buy you a beer? And let's talk about it. And and maybe ask about that joint. <laughs> Is that legal in Germany? Huh? I Close. Whatever. It is in Amsterdam. But uh, mm, it, do whatever enough. you need to. Get his attention. Uh, you know, maybe uh, say, here, you know, I'd like to give you a CD. I don't know if you have time to listen to it now, but here's my music. Uh, you know, here's a present. Uh, and, and can we talk about my performance tonight? What, what can we do here to work together? You know, do what you can. Even sometimes, you know, just a sticker can generate a yep. lot of goodwill. Um, We've got tons of stickers from tons of bands. Bands that give me all stickers, of our stuff. I'm willing to tell you, we'll get better treatment out of me. <laughs> Not for good reason. Like, you know, a gift goes a long way, and it didn't cost that. It took 20 cents to get a sticker made. Yep. You, can, you can get 250 stickers made up for $30 American, and they will buy you all sorts of goodwill. Uh, a T-shirt, I'll drive the limo. If you want red <laughs> carpet, I'll get some. Um, so, and I actually started, uh, we, I, we, we carry about 30 feet of it in yeah. our truck. I got, I got stickers made up to buy goodwill from bands. We're like, Hey guys, here's, here's a little something for your guitar cases. What can I do for you tonight? And right away they know, uh, they know I'm about to give them a good time. Yeah, good, and and you set. care. Yep. You're interested in them. So, uh, we're rapidly approaching being the longest podcast ever. So, um, like we always say at the end, we crave your attention, like the attention starved poodles that we are yep um, i look gorgeous by the way <laughs> it's just because we I'm, have poofy hair i'm all fluffed up it's not been that a while. high strong poodles yeah. are actually the one of the most highly intelligent and hardest working breeds of dog that there are i'll have you know thanks all state commercial died, died <laughs> <laughs> i knew that anyway i watched the dog shows on tv don't you know um but anyway we we love your letters we love your comments we love it when you retweet us on our, our tweets and stuff 
Uh, we like it when you click that like button on Facebook. That does a world of good for our self-confidence. It makes us want to keep going, keep putting the information out there for you. We would also love your questions. Um, <laughs> we are approaching 200 posts on the blog, which nice. you can find at uh, smart, the number two, noise.blogspot.com. Yep. Which is, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, it's been floating over the title for a good hour now. <clears throat> Better know it. <laughs> and... Uh, so anyway, uh, hit us up. We're, we've, we've pretty much written about everything we know to write about. We're fishing around for experiences, stories to tell. Um, so, Questions and we to don't, answer. We, and mostly, we, we just don't want to repeat ourselves. Like, hey, how many articles can you write about EQ, really? But uh, if you've got a specific question, we'd love to answer it for you. Um, and also, if, you're, if you have the courage, if you're up for it, we'd love to Skype you in and get you involved in a podcast just to, to talk to somebody who's not us. Because it's a, a pretty small circle of guys, and we can't always even... It's been, it's been us for a while. Hopefully, we'll get Blake in tomorrow. I haven't heard back from him yet. Yeah, we're actually going to record next week's podcast tomorrow. And uh, what day is it again? Uh, Cleveland. Right. Okay. So, yeah, anyway, this is going to air shortly, and the one that we record tomorrow is going to record... We're going to air next whatever, and... Next banana cream pie. <laughs> Mm. And it's getting late. It's getting late, <laughs> folks. And I got a long, another long one ahead of me, yep. and then another long one after that, and then a long one after that, and then I go home to my kids. Finally, I I've got cats. Uh. <laughs> but like I say, if I was rich, I'd still be doing this. Yep. I I love it to death. I maybe wouldn't do it quite so hard or as much. <laughs> <laughs> I might I might go home to my lovely family once in a while because they're cute and I like them. Um, they make fun noises. <laughs> They're good people. So anyway, that's a wrap. Uh, get in touch with us, please. Michael, we hope that helped and didn't confuse the issue further. Uh, if you'd like to fly us over uh, singly or as a group, we'd be happy to come mix one or many gigs for you. Uh, Lots. I, 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 I haven't been to Germany yet, so I'm, I'm I work game. for the Wesleyan Church, and they don't drink, but I don't, I'm not sure the rules apply in Europe. So if you want to pay me in beer, I could. Uh, you could can probably convince we, me. To we've fly got, we got. Don't we have shirts on print? We'll mix for Guinness. The better you pay us, the better you sound. Type thing. Do we have those? Are those are those floating around yet? Yeah, those will be coming coming in for spring. <laughs> and I'll have to remember not to wear it to work. Yep. Uh, so, that's yeah. That's that's a, a that, that's about it for us. Go out with a whimper. I'm gonna reach over. <laughs> <at the space. laughs> that's a wrap. And oh, it got long. Son of a whatever. All right. Thank you. Good night. Some